Um, I think I'm going to start. Um, so this lecture, I'll be talking, and probably lec next lecture too, I'll be talking about um, quantum-inspired algorithms or like dequantizing um, algorithms. And so the setup here is that um, we establish all of these quantum linear algebra algorithms. Um, and what they were capable of doing is they were capable of taking, um, for example, you know, a, a block encoding of um, of say a matrix A and a vector B, and then transforming it to um, block encodings of some say like P of A times B. And the thing that people notice is that this, this part, the sort of the overhead is, um, I guess like the overhead is the degree of the polynomial. Um, and so you can imagine that like, I have my A and B that are block encodings. They're say like size, um, size two to the n, but they're being implicitly represented by n qubits. And so um, if I'm able to um, do this operation with only incurring some overhead d, then maybe I could use um, this tool to get faster algorithms for um, linear algebraic problems more generally. Um, so for example, like as uh, I discussed earlier, if we have uh, A as like some sparse matrix um, with some, or like say it's like a, yeah, sparse with um, um, say like computable entries or something. Um, then what we can do is we can actually, um, and same with B, I guess, then I show that we can actually construct these block encodings, and these block encodings are efficient, meaning that they only scale in like the sparsity. Um, and so we can actually um, use this and then maybe somehow get something from the output, like some inner product of um, um, some like estimate here. And if you combine all the pieces together, you get something that takes time, say like polylogarithmic in your input dimension, in the dimension of A and B. And so, um, you know, if you, if, uh, you can imagine if you gave me A and B and gave me a classical computer and told me, okay, estimate like the first entry of P of A times B, what I would do is I would compute all, I would just uh, perform the polynomial um, multiplication and then this would take time linear in the dimension of A and B. Um, but somehow using this, we're doing significantly better. Um, and so there's been a lot of work trying to see how, how um, see whether you can, you can instantiate this um, to give speed ups for uh, real world tasks. And um, so one of the uh, notable examples of this is um, this algorithm by Harrow, Hasidim, and Lloyd for um, um, sparse linear systems. And it is basically what I just described, except you have this, uh, okay, the choice of this polynomial is going to be the one that is approximately the inverse. Um, or I suppose you could say it's like the inverse or pseudo inverse. Um, and this will scale with like, if you worked it out, what you'll get is like a runtime, a gate complexity that scales with um, your sparsity, the condition number of your matrix, and um, like, log of your dimensions. So here I'm saying these are, um, I'm gonna call it here m by n now. And so this is, it's gonna scale like this. 
And this is, uh, this is much smaller than the runtimes that we know how to, than the best runtimes we know for these classically, which is, um, I think it's, um, for some. That's right. Saying, like, this is the right framework to understand it in the same way that like phase estimation is the right framework for sure, or uh, amplitude amplification is the right framework for Grover or something. Like, it just sort of falls out. Yes. So I'm being ahistorical in my retelling of this. Um, Um, I actually don't remember. Okay. Does anybody know what the polynomial is for the original HHL? I, I don't. Um, I mean, they definitely wanted A inverse B. Yes. And they used it some kind of Taylor series to get it. Yeah. Um, they might have used a... Actually, okay. I don't, I don't want to say something wrong. I was going to say, like, <laughs> um, they might have used, like, a Fourier series, but I'm not sure. Yeah, but, um, yeah, that's a good point. Um, so I'm saying, I'm talking about this as if uh, these block encodings <laughs> um, already existed at the time, which is not the case. Um, but uh, uh, so over the course of this uh, sort of, quantum machine learning literature that began to develop after this, after this work. Um, there was one other strategy. People were wondering, like, OK, what I need is I need some way to get these block encodings. And so how can I get these block encodings? Or they didn't say block encodings, but um, that's, that was the question that they were not knowing that they were trying to answer. And so uh, people uh, started using this other notion of having um, your input A and B in some sort of data structure. So um, the idea is that what you could do is that you, if you have A and B in like some state preparation data structure, um, then what you can do is, um, in the same way that you're getting a block encoding here of, um, I should say like, you get a block encoding that sort of looks like A over S and then B over the norm of B. Here you're getting, um, you're able to get uh, block encodings of A over the Frobenius norm of A. So imagine A as a vector, then this thing would be unit norm as a vector. And um, also B over the norm of B. And so there, then what you can do is you can um, get your block encodings of PSV of A, and then do whatever you want with it at the end. And the nice thing about this is that in this setting, now A and B can be arbitrary, so they don't have to be sparse, which is convenient if you're working with, uh, you know, you want this thing to be ap applicable, so you want, um, this A and B to be data that comes from anywhere, um, or some, some data set, some machine learning data set or something. And so um, the idea is that now, instead of incurring some overhead, I was being a little bit um, sloppy here. There's some overhead that's like the degree of D, but once I rescale, I need to pay some addi additional factor that's like S. And here I need to pay something that's like um, the degree of P times like the Frobenius norm um, of A here. And if my Frobenius norm, if, if my matrix A has low stable rank, um, so it's like essentially it's being close to low rank in some sense, um, then this Frobenius norm is going to be close to the spectral norm, which we're taking to be one in this, uh, in this uh, uh, explanation. And so basically this algorithm is efficient um,
provided that your, your stable rank is low. And um, for example, these data sets you might expect to be low rank because um, they're coming from the real, real world and you're hoping that if your data is like explainable, then it can be explained with some few, um, some, uh, it can be explained with a few features or like some, some small number of linear, um, linear features, I guess. So here, S is the sparsity. Yeah, A and B are S sparse. Okay. P of X. Yeah. And, and kappa is the condition number? Kappa is the condition number of A. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, Okay, and so essentially there um, are basically these two regimes for how you try to like apply your QSVT knowledge to machine learning tasks. And there's a bunch of different uh, proposals that use one or the other to um, try to claim exponential speed up. And what these uh, quantum inspired algorithms are are um, what they're able to show is that um, in this context, uh, in this second diagram, these algorithms don't give exponential speed up. So, um, yeah, so I should say this is, doesn't give uh, exponential speed up. Um, so when I say it doesn't give an exponential speed up um, or like dequantizing, um, this is a pretty subtle notion because at any point um, if in your quantum algorithm, if you wanted to mess with me and give yourself an exponential speed up, you could. Um, so for example, like say my algorithm has like an output state, then what I could do is I could take the Fourier transform and then um, like measure some inner product with the Fourier transform. And then suddenly, uh, your algorithm is still paying polylogarithmic time, but then my algorithm um, is going to pay, have to pay linear time. Um, and so this like, notion of dequantizing is somewhat delicate. So um, feel free to ask questions. But um, basically, how it works is that for all the applications, this doesn't happen. Um, and so indeed, this is like what I'm saying here is true. Right. Oh, okay. So, okay. Uh, like, I am not claiming to dequantize this like sparse right. HHL version, right. but the state preparation thing is like it's very close to being like fully dequantized. Yes. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Um, right. Okay. Um, and so the way that we do this is that we have this like state preparation data structure. And what we're able to do is we're able to construct some analogous notion to a block encoding, um, which I'm going to call, I guess, um, sample and query access. Um, and it holds that these uh, state preparation data structures also OK, so what's happening if you're using these data structures is that you're imagining like, OK, I'm getting data. And then as I'm getting data, I'm storing it like, so that my quantum computer can use it later. Um, and in, when I'm storing it, I might be storing it in some quantum random access memory, um, which is just some speculative type of hardware such that I can query to it in superposition, um, which is different from like, you know, your classical RAM, which I, I don't know how to query in superposition. Um, and so the idea is that I have my quantum algorithm that does a particular thing with its data structure. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to access it classically. I'm only going to query it classically. Um, and I'm not going to use any of the quantum parts of this uh, quantum RAM. 
And so this that I'm going to develop is I'm going to develop a classical algorithm that gets a similar runtime, and it uses the same input data structure. Okay. Right, so um, I'm going to define this notion called sampling and query access, and then I'm going to show how you can get sampling and query access to something that's like approximately P applied to A. And this approximately is like, it, on, it only holds um, only if the Frobenius norm is small. So you can imagine this as being like, the error is like epsilon times Frobenius norm or something, Frobenius norm squared. And then I can use this to, for example, estimate these inner products as, as desired, um, or do more linear algebra. Okay, and so I'm gonna give this classical algorithm, and this classical algorithm runs only polynomially slower um, for some possibly large polynomial. Um, Wait, but, but can you specify for what task, and how is it like more special than, than all of HHL? For what task of? For what task does the classical algorithm work? Uh, Yes. So I believe if this error was in spectral norm instead, then you would dequantize HHL. I see. Yeah. So, so th that's that's the important thing. Ah, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, right. Okay. Um, okay. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about uh, what. Um, Dequantizing means, and then I'm going to get into the um, um, get into the sampling and query access stuff. Um, right. Okay. So hopefully, I'll get okay. I'll give an example that hopefully will motivate sampling and query access, and that example is the. Um, the swap test. Okay, so, so um, the swap. What the swap test is, is it's this um, algorithm um, that can estimate the overlap of two quantum states. Um, so let's suppose that we have two um, vectors. Um, and then they both have unit norm. And what we want to do is we want to compute their overlap here. Um, so their inner product um, magnitude squared. Then there's an algorithm that can do this um, with copies of the corresponding state. So I'm, I'm like, for a vector, I'm defining the corresponding state to be equal to the um, to be the, the state with the amplitudes corresponding to the entries of the vector. And what this algorithm is, is uh, we start with state corresponding to, um, states corresponding to each of our input vectors. Um, I perform a Hadamard and then a controlled swap. And then <coughs> I measure this output. Okay, and if you do the math about what the circuit outputs, what this measurement is is it's one with probability um, one half minus one half uh, here. So it depends on this overlap, and so. Uh, if you ran this circuit enough times, then what you could do, uh, so if you like, with one over epsilon squared runs, um, you get like an epsilon good estimate um, of the overlap. Okay, 
And uh, in order to implement this controlled, controlled swap, um, you need, um, I guess, um, here, this is like log D um, gates, or uh, two cubic gates. So the, the to total runtime will be um, gate complexity log D over epsilon squared. If you're not uh, trying to like improve this epsilon squared. Um, and so you could imagine uh, someone saying, OK, I have my phi and my psi, and I'm able to estimate their overlap. And I'm able to do it in um, time that's only log d, instead of if you give it to me classically, I would compute the inner product, and it would take d time. And so you could ask, like, okay, does this give me an exponential advantage um, for my like quantum linear algebra algorithm, my quantum machine learning algorithm? And this is like, I mean, this sounds far-fetched that you would expect some sort of speed up from this simple like, um, I guess like this overlap. Um, estimation task. Um, but for example, like if I, um, there's like certain minor points of this that would make this, um, if you change this in some minor ways, then it would actually genuinely become hard, right? Um, if I described what phi and psi were in terms of quantum circuits, um, and then I gave it to you, then you wouldn't be able to um, answer this o overlap question um, uh, you wouldn't be able to answer this overlap question uh, efficiently classically. And so there would be like some genuine speed up. Um, and similarly, like there's been um, like proposals in quantum machine learning that essentially boil down to like construct some fancy states based off of my input data, and then I compute their overlap, and this will be how I get advantage. Um, right, so so here I'm just noting that, okay, like my quantum algorithm is uh, like log D over epsilon squared, and my classical algorithm, um, in order to estimate the overlap, I need like to read it, uh, I need to read all of the entries. I need to know all the entries. And so this is like omega of D, but this is sort of not a fair comparison because, the qu because um, I gave my quantum algorithm this, this ability to prepare these states here of phi and psi, and this is a very powerful assumption. Um, if I w had this vector and I wanted to prepare the states, it would cost me d time. And so the fact that I can get these in like O of one time or O of, o of uh, log d time is very significant. It's like a pretty powerful statement. Okay, so how you would instantiate this in this data structure setting um, is with um, the following data structure. So I'm going to give an example for um, a size four vector. Um, and so the point is that like, if I actually wanted to run this on classical data, then I would need this uh, sort of data structure. Um, And what this is, it's, it's basically just a binary tree. And the point of this binary tree is that um, if I'm able to, so what, what I want, what I'm doing is I'm taking, computing all of these values in some pre-processing. And I'm storing every value that I've written down here in some piece of my memory. And then if I can do this, then there is an efficient um, way to prepare the state corresponding to phi. Um, and here efficient means few number of queries to my quantum RAM. And um, this would uh, you could imagine like doing this in a way, you can imagine in the same way that we imagine our, our random access memory being fast, even though technically it's um, polynomial time to query entries. We can imagine that our quantum RAM is really fast and that we could 
do these queries in like O of one time. Um, right. And so if we have our entries here, then we can prepare our quantum states and then actually perform this uh, swap test to estimate these overlaps. And what I'm going to claim to you is that if you give me the same data structure, um, uh, yeah, given phi and psi uh, in my data structure, we can estimate the overlap in, I guess, like, um, also one over epsilon squared time. So um, throughout the talk, I'm going to be, like, ignoring log d factors. There's some minor um, annoyances because the convention in classical algorithms is that log d size operations cost one. This is like a word RAM model. Um, but in quantum, you really care about these bits. So if I'm ever I'm off with the log d's, it's because of this. Um, but it's not, not important. Um, OK. And the way that we can do this is noticing that given this data structure, um, what we can do is we can we can classically measure um, phi in the computational basis. So in other words, there's some algorithm that I can run um, that runs in log, actually, there is a log d. Okay. That can run in log d time. And then it outputs some i with probability uh, phi i squared. And the way that I can do this is I look at my data structure. I start at the root node. And then I decide, OK, if I'm going to try to sample with prob probability proportional to the magnitude, am I going to uh, sample something with this this on this side or sample something on this side? And then I look at these entries, and then with probability this value, I go in this direction. And with probability, probability this, I go in this direction. And then so let's say I like move along here. This was probability uh, phi 1 squared plus phi 2 squared. Then I look at these two values, and I say, OK, do I want to go in this direction or in this direction? And then I flip a coin with probability, like, course, proportional to the, uh, each value, or pro probability proportional to um, the value, and then I recurse again. So let's say I go this direction, and that would occur with probability phi 2 squared over phi 1 squared plus phi 2 squared. And so when I hit a root node, then I output the corresponding index, too. And the thing to notice is that, OK, if I multiply these probabilities together, I get that I output 2 with probability phi 2 squared. And this holds like generally. Um, another way you can think about it is that um, I am getting, I'm computing each bit at a time and then sampling from the, I guess, posterior distribution. Um, yeah. OK, uh, so in this way, I haven't touched my quantum data structure class, uh, quantumly at all. But just with this classical uh, thing, I can get these uh, measurements. Um, and this will be useful for us. Any questions so far? Um, it is based on this one data structure. Ha um, however, I do not know of any instances where this is violated for like 
the generic problem of you give me some V, construct some data structure that can give me the state corresponding to V. Right. There's nothing in there that says that, I, that it has to, you know, encode uh, the, this binary tree. Yes. Um, I mean, yes. Is just, this, is just a, this is a particular assumption. Yeah. yeah. So what I'm saying is that um, I'm I'm less I'm more fuzzy on these details, but as as if you asked me if I gave you QRAM and I told you devise some data structure that allows me to prepare a state efficiently. Um, then for all of the data structures that, pe one, that people have imagined, you can actually do this thing of measuring classically. Um, and in fact, like a lot of the algorithms, a lot of the data structures people devise for the state preparation task directly come from data structures for sampling according to the probability distribution. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I would just make the weaker claim that if we're assuming that we can efficiently prepare the state, then if we want to compare to classical, then it seems fair to allow a classical algorithm to have this as the data structure. This is yeah. This is also true. I mean, yeah. It, if you're allowing me to prepare states, it seems eminently like, okay, it seems very reasonable to allow me to get classical measurements of the state as well. But um, yeah, I mean, there are slight subtleties because um, you could devise other versions of this, which are um, sort of in between my sparse model and, my, and this model. And because the sparse model is um, hard to simulate, it's sort of like, this uh, intermediate model also inherits this hardness or something. Um, but uh, yeah, all of these data structures are running in like, are like, you can pre-process them in linear time and so you, um, it's not really clear whether, if you give me one of them, this is like the one, that, the one it has to be and I can't just use my own if I'm doing, um, if I'm competing against you. Okay, any other questions? Yeah, um, there are other more imp more. There are other ways to create these. Like, there are other ways to satisfy these state preparation assumptions. So one thing you can imagine is that I do indeed have some like um, magic oracle that gives me the ability to query entries of of my v, and then this v satisfies some property. Like, um, it satisfies that all of the entries are about the same magnitude, and then I can prepare the corresponding state. And then if you gave me the same oracle, I could also sample, uh, perform the sampling using like rejection sampling. So um, yeah, so I'm, I'm being concrete here for the purposes of exposition, but you could think about this more generally. Um, okay. So what will my classical algorithm be? Well, it'll just be, um, like a sampling algorithm. So what I do is um, I can imagine, first of all, I sample i with probability uh, phi i squared. And then two, I consider some estimator. Uh, I, can, I compute uh, psi i over phi i. And I'll call this guy z. And the thing to notice is that the expectation of z is equal to, okay, it's this sum over i from 1 to d. Um, this is the probability that I sample it times the value. And if you, yes, this is phi psi. 
And similarly, if I look at my um, um, the variance, or the second moment, I guess, um, you can compute this, and this is, uh <coughs> let me see. Um, so it's probability times Do I have this right? Yes. So this is equal to the sum of my psi i squared, which is equal to 1. OK, so I have some random variable whose expectation is the right thing, and my variance is 1. So then I can uh, average 1 over epsilon squared uh, copies of z and then get some estimates. And because I'm estimating this value, I can estimate its magnitude squared, which is uh, gives me the right thing. OK. And so what we've just shown is this uh, argument that, OK, <coughs> you could uh, perform a swap test to estimate these overlaps in time log d. But if you gave me the same input, I could also get it classically with log d. Um, and this principle will extend more generally. And um, the idea is that we're going to be able to dequantize algorithms if we essentially get the set of assumptions that we need to run this algorithm. Um, so, um, this, so I'm going to define sampling inquiry axis now. So um, for vector v, um, we have sampling and query access to v. If we can answer the following kinds of queries, um, so first of all, what we want to do is we want to be able to query for entries. So this is like performing the map. I, you give me an index, and I give you the corresponding entry. Um, secondly, I can uh, sample from the state corresponding to v. So that means that I'm producing measurements, producing samples, where the probability of uh, sampling s is equal to vi squared over the norm of v squared. <coughs> and finally, that I can query for the norm of v. OK. Um, and so something that you can notice is, so wh what this is is I'm just defining some abstract um, access model. And then this access model can be satisfied by various means. So as I mentioned, there is this data structure here. And this data structure satisfies all my assumptions. I can query for the entries. I can query for the norm. And using this procedure I discussed, you can sample. So if ever gets confusing, uh, the sampling and query access you should just think of as like, I can simulate this data structure. And um, the reason, OK, the reason, OK, this might get a little bit confusing because um, it turns out that this sampling and query access uh, satisfies um, extensibility properties in the same way that these block encodings satisfied extensibility properties. Um, so for this, I'm going to define sampling and query access to a matrix. Um, so um, so now for a vector, or sorry, for a matrix, it's like m by n. We have um, sampling and query access to the matrix if um, we have sampling and query access to all of the rows. Um, right, so these are the rows of A. 
Um, and secondly, we have sampling and query access to little a, where a is corresponds to the row norms. Uh, so we have sampling and query access to the vector of row norms. And the way that you should think about it is that this corresponds to, so like if I imagine like my, I have a two by two matrix. This sort of corresponds to having um, to having in my data structure A stored as a vector. Um, so here I'm having like the Frobenius norm of A squared at the top, and then row one, row two, and then. Um, So it's the same, you know, sort of data structure, but basically I'm just combining the data structure. I can just say I have one data structure for this like row norm, um, for the vector of row norms, right? Because this is norm of a squared, a one squared, a two squared, and then I'm combining this with corresponding uh, these data structures for the individual rows. So um, that's just it. And then um, what I can show is that um, uh, there's extensibility properties. So for example, um, if I have sample and query access to um, A1 through AK, then I have sample and query access to some linear combination of them. For I equals 1 to K. And if I have sample and query access to A and B, and I can get sample and query access to their product a dagger b, but like um, approximately. <laughs> um, and this approximately you incur uh, for BDS norm dependence. Um, so the same extensibility properties hold. And so you can imagine, like, for any of my um, like block encoding algorithms that are computing polynomials. I could look at what the polynomial they're computing is. I could look at my classical algorithm, and I could just piece things together to match the quantum algorithm. And the point is that these uh, steps are all efficient. They, like their polynomial time, and they in sorry their polynomial time in parameters that the parameters uh, that do not depend on dimension. Their polynomial in epsilon, one over epsilon, and their polynomial in like um, my rank notion. Um, and so, like, I guess more morally, you can dequantize all of uh, quantum singular value transformation um, if you just take these and then um, uh, you can dequantize the all of QSVT. If you're assuming that your input has this like data structure is given as this data structure, um, okay. So now I'm going to explain how you can do these. But um, any questions? Okay. I do not know whether I can get to this now, but I might. If not, I'll get to next lecture. Um, get to these like properties. Um, there's some minor issue that I didn't discuss here, which is that there's some overhead cost that I'm going to say is, um, I'm going to call phi. Um, and I'm going to define a corresponding notion called like oversampling in query access. Um, and this basically just says like, sometimes I might not have access to the exact distribution that I want, 
but I have access to some distribution that is close enough to it that I can use it. Um, so, um, so um, for some vector, we have uh, this SQ phi of v, which I'm calling oversampling in query access. If, first of all, we can query um, for entries of v, and secondly, we have sampling and query access to some v tilde, which we're thinking of as like an entry-wise upper bound to v. So um, the two properties that need to be satisfied are that v tilde i is always greater than v i, and also the norm of v tilde is equal to phi times the norm of v. So if, um, if phi is equal to 1, then v tilde has to be v. So this is just a normal notion of sampling and query access. If phi is large, then um, this will be um, correspondingly, um, this, will, uh, this will create overhead in the same way as the scaling parameter alpha for the block encodings came out in the runtime. This is like the same, this, you, this is like the parallel between the two. And something that you can note is that if we have sampling and query access to v tilde, then we can get samples from v. So, um, so in this setting, if we, um, given sampling and query access to v tilde, we can sample from v and I think like expected um, in expectation. So phi, I guess phi queries. So this is we're considering queries um, to v tilde. And so the way that we can do this is via um, rejection sampling. So basically, I'm just trying to justify why it's OK to consider that sampling from a dis different distribution. I'm just trying to say, like, morally, you should view these as like, similar. And the approach here is to um, modify my distribution v tilde to get to v via rejection sampling. So my protocol will be, first of all, I sample i from v tilde, so this will happen with probability v tilde i squared over the norm of v tilde squared. And then I, uh, I look at v tilde i and I look at v i. And then I output i with probability um, v i squared over v tilde i squared. And then otherwise, I repeat. Um, I retry. OK. And so you can see that um, if I output um, if I output, if I'm able to output something, it'll be with probability, um, right? Yeah. So if I if I output something, it'll be with probability proportional to vi squared, right? Because the probability that I was able to perform this whole algorithm would be the product of these two, which is like um, vi squared over v tilde i squared. And so condition on outputting, uh, a condition on success, sorry, then this does output a sample from um, my distribution V. Um, and correspondingly, like, I can see that because I'm using this, um, 
because of this property, right? This is vi squared over um, phi times normal v squared. And so if I sum over all the possible i's, I can see that it, with, with probability 1 over phi, I'm going to succeed. <laughs> Sorry, this is like, I'm being sort of uh, messy um, or hand wavy. But um, finally, the thing to note is that this probability, this, this, this uh, fraction, by my entry-wise upper bound assumption, this is at most 1. So it's like makes sense to be able to sample with this probability. So altogether, this gives me some algorithm that with probability 1 over phi outputs a sample from v, given this one sample from v tilde. And so with phi queries and expectation, I'm able to, um, I'm able to get these samples from v. OK. Now. Finally, I'm going to discuss how to get linear combinations. Um, by the way, are there questions about this? Um, OK. Um, right. So. What I'm going to prove is that um, given sampling and query access to a bunch of uh, vectors, v, t, and um, we can get sampling and query access to um, their linear combination. But with some oversampling constant. And this oversampling constant is going to be tau times, OK. So here, this is for t from 1 to tau. And um, the oversampling constant is going to look like this. Um, and then the runtime, the overhead is going to scale with um, tau. So every time, so what I mean by this is that um, you give me sampling and query access to my input vectors, and I'm able to do these in, say, like O of one time. Then if you ask me a query, like, okay, sample from, if you ask me, like, sample from this vector u, then it'll take me time tau, um, or it'll take me, like, tau queries and, like, tau overhead, tau, tau additional time to compute, um, whatever I need, and then output the sample to you. So it's like, um, so, you know, for example, these might come from a data structure, but if I want to sample from this, I'm acting as like the data structure, and I'm being the intermediary here. I'm, simu I'm simulating these, these queries for you. And um, the way that you should think about this is that um, my if I wanted to produce a sample, it would cost me like phi times tau, so like um, in total, which is like uh, tau squared. And there's this uh, factor here, and this factor is going to be close to, um, it's going to be small whenever my linear combination is not too much smaller than I expect. So. If you give me a bunch of vectors and then ask me to take the linear combination and the linear combination is 0, then obviously I'm not going to be able to sample from 0. Um, and the thing to note here is that um, if you asked me to, if you gave me a bunch of block encodings and asked me to take the, the block encoding of the linear combination, um, 
then I would incur, I would also need to incur this like sort of scaling factor, right? Because if I take a linear combination of block encodings and I get zero, um, then I'm not going to be able to output a sample of, of that block encoding times a vector. Um, it's going to like come out in the runtime. Um, so, okay. Um, so how am I going to do this? Um, well, I need to answer a few types of queries, right? Okay, so I, I want to get sampling and query access to this U. And so I need to answer queries to U. And so what are these queries? These queries are um, lambda t um, and then I want to compute uh, things of this form. This takes me, sorry, not the tau. I just need to query all of the vectors in their particular entries and then take the linear combination and then I output this. So this takes me uh, tau time to compute. The second thing I need is I need sampling and query access to some upper bound on U. Okay. And what am I going to use as my upper bound? Um, well, I know that my entries take this form, and I want to compute some uh, upper bound to this that I can easily sample from. Um, so, if you were doing this, um, you could like think about it for a second, but um, I'll just tell you the answer, which is that um, you can take this to be your value. Um, Um, right, so I'm taking, this is like the, s the linear combination of the, these entries, and I'm sort of taking the norm. And this is upper bounding this quantity, which is ui, by Cauchy-Schwartz. And, okay, what are the two properties that we needed? We needed that this, mag this magnitude is greater than this magnitude. This holds by um, Cauchy Schwartz, as I said. And then we need also that the, we can sample from this. And so the probability that we need to sample from is um, we need to sample from i with probability proportional to this sum. And I'll write it in a slightly different way. And what this distribution is, is it's a linear combination of the distributions for each of the Vs. So um, what I can do is I can sample, I can pick a distribution such that um, if I sample from that distribution and then sample the corresponding from the corresponding vector, then this will give me this distribution. Um, okay, that might have been a bit quick, but um, it's in the lecture notes if you want to look look at it. And if you look at the norm, the value of the norm would be um, the value of the oversampling would be this. Okay, um, I think I'm done for today. <laughs>